The shape of humanity's past, present, and future is intertwined with nature. Our lives are directly shaped by the animal world, and vice versa. Many thousands of years ago, our prehistoric ancestors were forced to protect themselves against the larger animal. Bees impact our food production, bats control insect populations, and without baby monkey going backwards on a pig, I don't know where we'd be as a civilization. Yet it is a special relationship with a few key species that really allowed our species to take off. This is domestication. Probably food was one of the first uses to which animals were put. I'm just Heating, and you're watching Animal Logic Second Nature. Domestication is the process in which humans change a wild species by selectively breeding favorable traits. It's how we go from a hulking wolf to a chattering chihuahua. Be careful there, fella. If you don't fold in those ears, you're going to take off in the breeze. By selecting which specific animals can procreate, you can fine-tune different breeds to look or behave a certain way. Have a rat problem? Breed dogs that are prone to ratting. Need a helping hand with your livestock? Breed dogs that have strong predatory instincts, but don't treat cattle as prey. Need a cute gift for your kids? Breed dogs with shorter, fatter, and uglier faces. Domestication obviously isn't all dogs, but they do exemplify the extreme range of development that can be accomplished via domestication, which can oftentimes be unethical. Greyhounds have been bred for speed. Alaskan Huskies have the job of hauling heavily loaded sleds. The wire-haired Fox Terrier are quick as a flash on the getaway. The Collie's good temper and disposition, together with his size and strength, make him one of the best of all watchdogs for safety. Domestication has had an irreversible effect, not only on the species we domesticated, but on ourselves as well. The rise of domestication through the world saw a marked shift in human culture and society. We moved away from hunter-gatherer and nomadic lifestyles and instead became herders and farmers. Before domestication, hunter-gatherer peoples depended on species that were abundant in their territory. Found a herd of buffalo. At last, meat for supper. In Europe, they ate a lot of red deer. In the Middle East and Asia, they ate gazelle. In North America, they ate bison. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, where species were more diverse and abundant, they ate a wider range of prey. Despite their popularity, none of these species were successfully domesticated. Of all the millions of species on Earth, we have only been able to domesticate a handful. This is because there are six characteristics that an animal must have in order to be successfully domesticated. One, their food must be cheap, plentiful, and ideally something we don't eat. This is why herbivores are far and away the most successful domesticated species, while not many carnivorous species have been domesticated. Two, they need to grow fast. Domestication is a game of inputs and outputs. An animal that eats a lot but doesn't give much meat, milk, or eggs isn't a useful animal. Three, they have to be able to reliably breed in captivity. This rules out a lot of species. Four, they have to be calm and passive enough that we're not fearful for our lives around them. Five, they have to be comfortable enough around humans that their fight or flight instinct doesn't kick in in stressful situations. And six, they have to be social. Solitary species are much less likely to accept humans as part of their group. These six characteristics narrow down the millions of species on the planet to about 50 that we've been able to domesticate. Everyone who has and loves a dog thinks that his dog is the best. Dogs are not only our best friends, but our oldest friends. They were the first species that we domesticated. The ancestors of dogs diverged from gray wolves between 20 and 40,000 years ago, and we first domesticated them between 10 and 15,000 years ago. Wolves made great candidates for domestication because the hierarchical structure of their pack 
mirrors human societies quite well. Wolf packs have dominant members and subservient members, and so a dominant human could fit into this social order quite well, becoming the pack's alpha member. Over time, the aggressive dogs would be kicked out of our packs, and the helpful and more subservient ones would be kept and allowed to breed. And soon, they were domesticated, developing floppy ears and curly tails as domestication syndrome kicked in. Come on, Jean, and play. There. Go away once and for all. Domestication syndrome is an interesting consequence of domestication. In most domesticated animals, the species will see a shift in appearance as well as behavior. This includes things like having shorter faces, smaller teeth, smaller brains, color changes, changes to ear and tail shape, and more frequent breeding cycles. Cats are one of our oldest companions, although we never really domesticated them. They domesticated themselves. Well, here is Mother Cat at the kitchen door. I suppose that you're still hungry. Cats have been found in human grave sites as old as 10,000 years. Stone Age cats have even been found in areas to which they are not native, like Cyprus, meaning that we brought them there. The variety of wild cat from the Middle East, Phyllis sylvestris libica, is thought to be the origin of all domestic cats. The main reason that cats began to hang around with us lowly humans was agriculture. As we started farming, our grain-rich land began attracting rodents. The wild cats were then attracted to the rodents, thinking, I can has rodent? And like dogs, followed the commensal path towards domestication. They realized that they could get more food by sticking with us, and we found that we could get help from them, killing rodents, controlling pests, and eventually getting us fake internet points with dank memes. While dogs were selectively bred to be different shapes and sizes to accomplish particular tasks, like ratting, herding, and hunting, cats weren't. The cats that could tolerate human environments basically selected themselves to be the ones we kept. They allowed us to keep them around. The species which man has domesticated is shown by this small cube. Most of these were domesticated by man before history began. Sheep and goats were the first livestock to be successfully domesticated. This happened around 10,500 years ago, followed by cattle and pigs about 500 years later. In South America, about 8,000 years ago, they had a much smaller and a much cuter domesticated food source. In the mountains, people domesticated a small, fat, and apparently delicious rodent called the guinea pig. They were domesticated so well that they are both an excellent food source and great as pets. Around the same time in China, a large group of farmers were able to turn mallards into domesticated ducks. But it would be in South Asia where the king of domesticated poultry would arise. The red jungle fowl is a species of bird that was domesticated simultaneously in different areas of Asia, and by 1000 BCE, they had spread across Europe and Africa. The chicken. Chickens are specialists in meat production. Here is one dressed and ready for cooking. These birds were so successful because they could survive from their own foraging. Chickens have no teeth, so they swallow their food whole. And supplied humans with both meat and eggs. They could also lay eggs very frequently, and those chickens that laid eggs the most often were selectively bred for that characteristic. Domestication altered the course of human civilization, and there was no species that was more important to us than the horse. Horses have carried us through war, peace, feast, and famine. While they have been used for food, it's as transport where they really hit their stride. And until the train was invented, the fastest way to traverse land was on horseback. It was from a saddle that human civilization became globalized. Horses were used to transport the product of another domesticated species, but this one isn't a mammal, the silk moth caterpillar. These larval moths have been domesticated for at least 5,000 years and were used to fuel China's silk industry.
unlike domesticated bees, which aren't terribly different from wild bees, silk moth caterpillars have some striking differences from their wild counterparts. First of all, they are bred to be silk producing machines. Domesticated silk moth caterpillars produce 10 times more silk than wild ones. They also grow much faster, require less food, are less stressed by humans, and are more comfortable in cramped spaces. They have been purpose-bred to be beneficial to us. As spinning begins, he expels fluid from each of his small glands to a tongue-like depositor on his upper lip. This fluid, upon contact with the air, forms a single filament, or a strand of silk. Unfortunately, like with a lot of domesticated species, it's come at a cost. Adult domesticated silk moths have lost their coloration, and they are completely unable to fly. For every domesticated species, there are thousands in which domestication didn't take. Zebras are a good example of this. While they may appear very similar to horses, they have one key difference that makes them untenable for domestication. They are adapted for life in highly dangerous habitats. They live in sub-Saharan Africa, a biome filled with large predators, always on the lookout for large prey. And so, the zebra has always been much too skittish for domestication to work. Easily, the most disappointingly undomesticated species is the moose. Many people have attempted to domesticate moose over the years, including King Carl XI of Sweden and Stalin in an attempt to establish a moose cavalry. But unfortunately for badassery everywhere, they have always failed. This is because moose don't fit the six requirements for domestication. Like other deer, moose don't like being approached. Their huge size makes them hard to handle and dangerous to interact with. They are incredibly aggressive during rutting season. And finally, at the slightest hint of danger, they are uncontrollably panicky. Which is too bad, because riding a moose just might be the most intimidating thing you can do. It would take our Mounties to the next level. Fortunately, there is at least one badass instance of moose riding, even if it is photoshopped. Though there is one species that is flaunting the rules of domestication, the fox. Rule number six is that the species have to be social, but foxes aren't. But a lab in Novosibirsk, Russia, for the past 60 years, has been breeding red and silver foxes, selecting for friendliness. And slowly, the foxes have started showing domestication syndrome and are definitely friendlier than their wild counterparts. It is estimated that today, nearly four-fifths of the people of the Earth as shown by the dark portions of the continents, still depend upon the power of animals to help them in their work. Thanks for watching. Whatever, I'll, I'll figure it out. Dogs and wolves make great candidates for domestication because the hierarchical structure of their society mirrors our, what? Ours rather well. Mirrors ours. Ours mirror, ours. mirrors ours. Mirrors ours. Try saying that. That's mirrors hard. Ours. Mirrors ours. I can't say it without a weird like like accent back in my neck here, like a town crier. <laughs>